said that Dali had a faculty for publicity that should turn any circus press agent green with envy. And it was true. Dali was a master at staging spectacular stunts that generated huge amounts of hype. He appeared in Life magazine six times, and he even created his own newspaper, which was called, of course, The Dali News. Dali was one of the first artists in history to so wantonly court publicity. He was also one of the first to inject some irreverent fun into the pompous, earnest world of fine art. He was the trailblazer for later superstar artists like Andy Warhol and more recently Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons. This studio belongs to Jeff Koons, one of the most successful artists working anywhere in the world today. His art sells for millions of dollars, and it's witty, playful and irreverent, and definitely draws upon Dali's sense of the surreal. He's absolutely one of my favourite artists, so I'm really excited to be meeting him. Koons and his team transform familiar objects into witty and pretty bizarre works of art. Recently, his work has included inflatable toys that pay homage to Dali's moustache and his love of lobsters. When I uh, saw this, you know, uh, you know, I loved the shape of it, that it's both uh, male and female. But if you look at the tentacles, it's very much like Dali's moustache. Hugely like it, yeah. And, but it also, it, so it's, it's masculine, it has arms like an acrobat, quite athletic, but the tail, the tail's like, you know, uh, uh, a Venus. Yeah. It's, uh, but is this so in a way feminine. your portrait of Dali? I think it makes reference to Dali and one of Dali's great friends, Marcel Duchamp. They always print on these pool toys that this is not a life-saving device, but, you know, art is a life-saving device. And so I always like that, uh, kind of contradiction and also this gives you a sense of equilibrium when you're in the water. Coons's work is joyfully surreal from his balloon dog and silver rabbit to his huge puppy made out of flowers. You can see the debt to Dali who he first encountered when he was a teenager. I met Dali in 73 so uh, I found out that he was at the St. Regis Hotel, and so I called up and he answered the phone. And I, I told him, I'm just a young artist, uh, I would love to meet him. And he said, well, you know, come up Saturday morning and I'll meet you at the hotel at noon. I arrived, I was there, and right at noon he was in the lobby. And he had on a, a fur coat and he had a, a tie with diamond pins in it and an elaborate cane. I have a photo I'd love to show you. But uh, this is a, a photograph of... Uh, from that uh, moment and I just remember that you know I was very uh, uh, I was excited and I remember him saying you know uh, you have to hurry up he fixed his mustache he put it up and he said you have to hurry up Jeff because you know I can't hold this pose all day <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he said Jeff but probably young boy or something. You'd like to think he did. Now, that evening I really thought well, you know I can do this too I mean, you know art can be a, a complete way of life for me I can spend all my time uh, doing it and I really had a, a, a sense of uh, possibility. You know I think Dali very much was about kind of the uh, expansion of of a uh, horizon and a possibility, a great symbol of the avant-garde. So Dali's work expanded the boundaries of what's possible, challenging and unsettling us by throwing together the unexpected. And that's just what we see walking down today's catwalks, like the late Alexander McQueen's designs, which drew on unlikely way out references. Even high street fashion has embraced surrealism, and this is largely thanks to Dali, who back in the 30s was turning clothes into an extension of his art. Taking inspiration from his paintings, like this one, he and fashion designer Elsa Schiaparelli created a range of surrealist tinged clothing. The tear dress created the illusion of ripped skin showing the flesh beneath and the shoe hat turned convention on its head. They even designed a dress featuring Dali's favorite crustacean, which he thought was somehow sexually suggestive. 
an illusion perhaps not lost on Wallace Simpson just before she married Edward VIII. And today, celebrities like Lady Gaga certainly continue the tradition of seriously surreal fashion. The glittering world of high fashion acquainted Dali with jewellery, another delight for his inventive spirit. He designed brooches like tearful eyes and ruby red lips with pearls for teeth. But it wasn't just wearable jewellery. Typically, Dali pushed things even further later in his career, blurring the line between jewellery and sculpture, creating jaw-droppingly intricate objects that on closer inspection deliver a surreal twist. In 2007, Damien Hirst made headlines with his skull covered in more than 8,500 diamonds. It was on sale for 50 million pounds. But Dali had got there first. More than half a century before Damien Hirst caused a sensation with his diamond skull, Dali was already designing jewellery, and pretty weird jewellery at that. This piece is called the Royal Heart, and it consists of a heart made of rubies that's beating in the middle of a gold setting. It's not to everybody's taste. It's quite brash and possibly even grotesque, but there's something quite mesmerising about watching this very hard substance, the ruby, look incredibly soft and flesh-like there in the middle of the brooch. By the 1940s, Dali had produced numerous surrealist masterpieces, made a groundbreaking film, and introduced surrealism to fashion and jewellery. The really weird thing is that even though Dali had done all of this stuff to promote surrealism right around the world and make it this incredibly famous and popular artistic movement, the founder of the movement, André Breton, wasn't happy. And he actually expelled Dali from the surrealists altogether, ridiculing his love of fame and money with a catchy anagram that transformed Salvador Dali into a vida dollars, which basically means greedy for bucks. More seriously, the predominantly left-wing surrealists took deep offence when Dali failed to protest against the rise of fascism across Europe. They particularly disapproved of him depicting Hitler in some of his paintings. The surrealists may have disowned him, but Dali didn't care. He thought he was surrealism, with or without the official stamp. He simply aimed his sights higher and headed to Hollywood, known as the Dream Factory after all. Everybody comes to Hollywood. They want to make it in the neighborhood. As soon as he arrived, he was in the limelight, throwing lavish, bizarre and star-studded parties. Ever since Dali's early success with his surreal films, he'd been keen to return to the biggest, most mainstream canvas on offer, cinema. In 1944, Alfred Hitchcock commissioned Dali to design the dream sequences for his new psychological thriller, Spellbound. The film starred Ingrid Bergman as a frosty psychoanalyst who falls in love with her amnesiac patient, played by Gregory Peck, who might or might not be a killer. It was one of the first films to treat the subject of psychoanalysis seriously, paving the way for Hitchcock's later masterpieces like Psycho and Vertigo. The studio loved the idea of Dali's involvement because it guaranteed free publicity. They estimated that the commercial value of his name was $50,000, an enormous amount for the 40s. For his part, Dali believed that he was about to ignite Hollywood with his surrealist art. seemed to be a gambling house but there weren't any Dolly designed the backdrops for